quickly take their seats. Um, thanks to everyone for, for coming today. We have an incredible lineup of speakers, so I'll keep my introductory remarks brief. As readers of the Capital Forum, you all know we love to dig into the weeds when it comes to competition policy. And today, we're going to dig into the details around key pending and recent decisions, Comcast Time Warner Cable, AT&T DirecTV, Charter Time Warner Cable, Altice Cable Vision, as well as net neutrality litigation and regulatory responses uh, to behaviors like usage-based pricing and, and what, 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 what do we mean by managed services. And these decisions, decisions on these issues, will go a long way to shape the competitive landscape for the broadband industry going forward. And while the rest of today we're going to focus on these details, I want to take a brief step back to create a framework for thinking about competition in broadband. And we need a framework because there's so much disagreement over what competition in the broadband industry actually means. We know competition is a priority for both sides of the political spectrum, but not everyone agrees on what competition means. And so to better understand what competition means in this industry, I think we have to explore a broader question. What is the proper competitive structure for the wireline broadband industry? Some in our audience, congressional staff, FCC staff, and state policymakers can think about that broad question and can shape the competitive structure with policy decisions. Others in our audience, including DOJ and state antitrust officials, can think about that question, but their role is more to enforce the competitive landscape laid out by Congress. And further, uh, lawyers, industry representatives, and industry stakeholders in the audience will support or face off against the government uh, in, in, at the agency or in court over the details of any rules. Others are here to better understand how all of these decision makers will act to establish and enforce a competitive structure. And today we're going to hear from both sides of the political and ideological spectrum. One end of the spectrum believes in a hands-off approach to the broadband industry, to let broadband executives invest, price, and provide services largely as they see fit. The other end of the spectrum believes that monopoly utilities should be regulated by the government with strict pricing and behavioral rules. Clearly, there, is, there are also options in between those ends of the spectrum. And I want to quickly talk about two potential competitive structures and some key questions that our audience should keep in mind throughout the day. The first potential competitive structure I want to highlight is broadband as a regional monopoly with varying levels of regulation. If policymakers are okay with monopoly markets, then a discussion about, about competition is really about whether or not rules are needed to ensure that competition occurs up and down the supply chain. The second potential competitive structure I want to highlight is broadband as a regulated competitive structure in which policymakers encourage competition at the broadband provider level. If policymakers want competition among broadband providers, they're going to have to find a way to ensure new entry, incumbent overbuilding, and or municipal investment. It seems that consensus among policymakers is generally to prefer a competitive framework. But there has been a realization that we are stuck, potentially indefinitely, with a regional monopoly framework. Perhaps the most important questions related to competitive structure in the broadband markets are those about timing. How long are policymakers willing to wait for entry? How quickly will policymakers respond to decisions by, by monopoly providers that allegedly threaten competition? Today, we want to create a forum for discussion so that we can all better understand and explore the political, economic, and public interest issues that will drive consideration of the policies that will create these different competitive structures. Lastly, this is a forum to debate the consequences of these different competitive structures, the cost to the government, to citizens, to companies, and the benefits, innovation, investment, choice, entrepreneurship, and liberty that result from getting competition law right when it comes to broadband. With that, I'd like to quickly introduce uh, our first speaker, former FTC Commissioner Josh Wright. Josh Wright is, a, is currently a professor of law at George Mason University School of Law. Before his time as F FTC Commissioner, Professor Wright was the inaugural scholar in residence at the FTC Bureau of Competition. Professor Wright is a leading scholar of antitrust law, economics, 
intellectual property, and consumer protection, and has published more than 70 articles and book chapters, co-authored a leading antitrust case book, and edited several book volumes focusing on these issues. And with that, please uh, give a warm welcome to uh, former Commissioner Josh Wright. Thank you. It's great to be here, um, and, and thanks for having me uh, to the Capitol Forum. I, uh, in my old job, whenever I had a microphone in front of me, had to begin by saying, don't hold the things I say for the next 15 minutes against uh, the other commissioners and so forth. Uh, but now I get to tell you what I really think about things, uh, and you can, you can just blame me. Or if I think you should blame them, I can say that now, I guess. Uh, so uh, when deciding what to talk about today, I sort of was uh, looking at the conference agenda, and it's an impressive lineup of speakers, uh, and a number of foundational themes emerge. Um, uh, mentioned in the introduction, I'm, a, I'm an antitrust lawyer, and so one of the, uh, an economist, and one of the themes that tends to jump out to any antitrust lawyer or economist when he gets anywhere near uh, telecommunications or the FCC is the uh, tried and true good old-fashioned debate between uh, the tension, if any, between the public's interest standard applied by the FCC uh, and the consumer welfare standard embraced by the antitrust laws. Um, now, I also notice the agenda is filled with folks who know much more about telecom law and the FCC uh, than I do, so I thought I'd try to spend some time this morning uh, talking from some perspectives in which I might have some prayer at having a comparative advantage. Um, my background is that of a former uh, FTC commissioner, one who worked at the Federal Trade Commission four times, uh, twice as an intern in the smallest cubicle in the Bureau of Economics in the building, and the last time with a really lovely third floor office with a balcony overlooking Capitol Grill. Um, I, do I sound like I miss it too much? Um, and I recently left the commission to return to, to, to George Mason, where I'm an antitrust law professor and, and an economist. So I thought uh, those three perspectives, a former commissioner at the FTC uh, and the FTC perspective on broadband regulation, and an antitrust economist and a lawyer would be uh, sort of a, a few angles from which I would uh, discuss broadband competition uh, with you today. Now, let me start with uh, the first, sort of my, uh, with my former FTC commissioner hat on. Um, and for this, I'm going to talk more about consumer protection and broadband than I am competition. Uh, to begin with, and this was something that uh, I did say while I was a commissioner, um, I don't think that there's any doubt that the FTC was a net, net loser in the net neutrality wars. Uh, I described uh, elsewhere during my time as commissioner of the FC FCC's Title II reclassification uh, as something akin to taking the FTC's jurisdictional lunch money. Uh, I think that description holds true. Uh, I thought it then, I think it now. There's simply no debating the fact that reclassifying broadband internet providers as common carriers under Title II, uh, as the open internet order does as it stands now, strips the FTC of jurisdiction, uh, including its unique ability to seek consumer redress to regulate broadband providers uh, as part of its core consumer protection mission. Now, we can, and I suspect uh, later in the context of, of uh, discussing privacy regulation of broadband, have an interesting discussion about precisely what it means to have uh, the FCC and not uh, the FTC, or the FTC and not the FCC, or to have them both means uh, in terms of consumer protection regulation. But the FTC's long experience enforcing Section 5 of the FTC Act, which prescribes deceptive unfair acts or practices, in my view, is beneficial for consumers. And consumers, at least for now, will not reap the benefits of enforcement activity in that area. Now, if one reads speeches from uh, current FTC commissioners, and staff for that matter, there's simply nothing to see here with the Title II reclassification. Move on. The current position appears to be, well, if only Congress would pass the common carrier exemption, uh, then everything would be just fine. Uh, if only the FCC decides that it won't attempt to expand uh, anywhere near edge providers, then the FTC will have something to do, and that will be just fine, too. Uh, and of course, uh, most of these speeches 
uh, say that the FTC and the FCC with respect to consumer protection regulation work well together, uh, hold hands and regularly sing. The more regulation, we can have them both work together, of course, uh, and the more regulators, the merrier. Uh, it doesn't have to be much of a, more than a casual fan of the history of regulation to suspect that the FTC's repeated insistence that taking its jurisdiction by majority vote of a sister agency is just fine is probably a, a, what we might call a tell, or that the overlap and work it out later approach probably isn't as good of a deal for consumers as it sounds. I continue to believe, as I did then when I was at the FTC, that the agency, FTC I mean, fought too little and too late to retain its jurisdiction. That was something uh, I tried to get my, my colleagues to agree with me on uh, when I was at the commission and to put up a little bit more of a fight. I lost that one, uh, but uh, <coughs> I think it's important to note, and I think the FTC uh, is going to find itself in a position uh, where it is going to need to stand up for its consumer protection jurisdiction if it intends to keep it. Let me switch gears and get into sort of uh, a little out of consumer protection and into antitrust and start by talking about broadband competition and its regulation from the perspective of an antitrust economist. And while I'm not specifically in these comments addressing uh, FCC or FTC and DOJ merger review, I'm going to talk mostly about net neutrality, many of the same points apply to the imposition of net neutrality like conditions uh, in merger review, which regardless of which agency they're imposed by. For those not familiar, uh, a vertical restraint is a contractual arrangement between two entities operating in the same supply chain. This is a term of art economists like to use to distinguish between agreements between competitors as opposed to uh, complements or folks in the same supply chain. For example, broadband providers and content providers occupy different positions in the same supply chain. Next, Netflix customer needs content uh, supplied through Netflix and broadband access supplied through any one of a number of broadband providers in order to enjoy Netflix video streaming product. An arrangement between Netflix and the broadband providers, what economists describe as uh, a vertical restraint. Now the world's full of vertical restraints. Uh, contracts to, uh, between uh, grocery store manufacturers for shelf space at the retail level, uh, various forms of distribution contracts, vertical arrangements between firms with market power, without market power, and retail distribution, and high-tech markets, and markets involving intellectual property, uh, and widgets, beer, and soda. Um, all around, we've seen, and economists have studied for nearly 100 years, the impact of, and the competitive impact of vertical restraints. At its heart, to an antitrust economist, what the open internet order does, or what merger reviews that result in conditions uh, that impose net neutrality conditions consistent with the current open net in internet order, essentially amount to a per se prohibition on vertical contracts. Now, they do so out of fear, uh, and that's been well expressed by the FCC and others, that these vertical contracts result in an incentive uh, to disadvantage rivals and ultimately harm competition. Support for this fear in the economics literature for modern vertical foreclosure theory emerges from something economists like to call raising rivals cost, um, <coughs> originating from uh, Steve Salop, a fantastic economist at, at Georgetown University and a handful of other authors. Now that economics literature outlines the conditions under which a monopolist can disadvantage rivals, reduce competition, and harm customers. That theoretical literature is something like 40 years old. It's well understood by economists. Every graduate school economist learns this uh, in their first year of graduate school, maybe their second year of graduate school. And economists have been studying vertical contracts, and it's an important topic uh, within antitrust economics, for a long time. Indeed, there's little dispute among industrial organization economists today that it is indeed impossible, it is possible, to use vertical restraints to harm competition. But that possibility represents but one side of the consumer welfare ledger. The fundamental failing of the open, edit, open internet order, in my view, is that it creates a categorical prohibition, a per se prohibition, if you will, against vertical contracts without acknowledging the vast economic literature and empirical evidence that support the view that such vertical arrangements aren't just sometimes pro-competitive, they are usually pro-competitive. Although it's well accepted, that vertical restraints, the type at the heart 
of the open internet order can occasionally lead to anti-competitive for foreclosure under some conditions. It's also been understood that those arrangements are part of the normal competitive process. But let's talk about the empirical evidence in a little bit more detail. Over the last 25 years in particular, with increases in econometric techniques and access to data, there's been a concerted effort to pair a robust set of empirical evidence with the various economic models of, of vertical restraints. These studies undeniably paint a picture that vertical restraints are indeed typically pro-competitive. And that view cuts sharply against the idea that these contracts and broadband markets are likely, much less generally, harmful to competition. Here are a few highlights from the literature. One survey of the existing empirical literature, about 30 different studies on vertical contracts cutting across a lot of different industries, um, by a group of economists at the FTC and DOJ, and from enforcement agencies, observes that, quote, empirical analyses of vertical integration and control have failed to find compelling evidence that these practices have harmed competition, and numerous studies find otherwise. And while, quote, some studies find evidence consistent with both pro and anti-competitive effects, Virtually no studies can, can claim to have in identified instances where vertical practices were likely to have harmed competition. Another set of empirical studies surveyed by a uh, recently resigned FTC Bureau of Economics Director Francine LaFontaine reaches a similar conclusion. Again, quoting, it appears that when manufacturers choose to impose restraints, not only do they make themselves better off, but they also typically allow consumers to benefit from higher quality products, better service provision, more innovation. The evidence thus supports the conclusion that in these markets, manufacturer and consumer interests are apt to be aligned when it comes to vertical restraints. Yet a third study, again by agency economists, cites recent studies, studies just within the last decade, and says with few exceptions, the literature simply doesn't support the view that these practices are generally used for anti-competitive reasons. Indeed, the handful of anecdotal examples of foreclosure by broadband providers that you're all familiar with and are normally, normally bandied about in debates over net neutrality and antitrust in the context of vertical contracts <coughs> evinces the, per, the pervasively pro-competitive nature of the contracts. In the order itself, the FCC satisfied it, itself with respect to the need to cite any economic analysis demonstrating vertical foreclosure in broadband markets by citing a single study. And that was a study not about broadband services, but about cable video. And it should be further noted that one paper merely suggested anti-competitive vertical integration was possible, but didn't demonstrate it or document it with data. To be clear, once again, the economic literature and empirical evidence doesn't claim and certainly doesn't demonstrate that the vertical restraints at issue in the net neutrality debate can never generate foreclosure or competitive concerns. Just that they can do, possibly, and that it's relatively rare, at least compared to pro-competitive uses of the same contracts. What the theoretical literature and empirical evidence demonstrate, however, is that those captured by the open internet order are not always anti-competitive, in most cases pro-competitive. That's a critical observation for answering the question, which I think is at the heart of much of the discussion today, what kind of regulatory regime and legal rules governing this behavior will best serve consumers? The open internet order, in my view, and merger conditions, which include net neutrality provisions consistent with that order, do consumers a disservice by employing an overly rigid, one-size-fits-all, per se, categorical ban on conduct that economists have long known often generates benefits for consumers. The real question is whether the type of rule embodied by the open internet order is the best we can do for consumers in terms of regulating broadband com competition when needed. I don't think so. This raises important questions about the tension between public interest and the consumer welfare standard. We had to talk about it eventually. Now once again, officials from both agencies are quick to announce that when it comes to any tension between the public interest standard applied by the, FTC, by the FCC and the consumer welfare standard embraced by the antitrust laws, there is again nothing to see here. In preparing for this speech, I decided uh, to uh, get on my uh, search engine and look around for recent speeches by antitrust officials. One from the FTC, a colleague of mine, uh, gave a speech saying that from an antitrust perspective, a per se ban on vertical contracts uh, is a perfectly fine idea. A top DOJ official, indeed the top DOJ official, gave a speech a few months ago 
when he announced that the open internet order and a per se prohibition against vertical restraints, a position rejected uniformly in antitrust law since before I was born, was a good idea. Somebody should tell the economists. Nor is it difficult to find speeches from FCC officials proudly announcing how FCC merger review now adopts sophisticated economic tools uh, just like antitrust. At least except when it doesn't. I have no doubt they do so. And <coughs> the question is whether the economic analysis has much to do with commission decision making. And that's a question about institutional design, not a critique of the economists. But having set the stage in terms of the economics of vertical restraints, let me put my antitrust lawyer hat on and try to make the case that the antitrust laws are much better suited to address the problem at the core of the net neutrality debate. The Open Internet Order's proposal to place an outright ban on paid prioritization is a per se prohibition. If there was strong evidence that the types of vertical contracts treated by the ban uh, harmed competition, the categorical ban would be perfectly justifiable. Antitrust law has categorical bans. It has categorical bans, for example, for naked price fixing. It has categorical bans where the evidence is demonstrated over time through ju judicial learning and economic experience that the conduct we're looking at always or almost always harms consumers. In those cases, consumers are best served by a per se prohibition. The question is whether vertical contracts are that type of, of restraint. I've tried to talk to you already and persuade you that that's simply not the case. The best available evidence actually points in the opposite direction. Vertical contracts are far more likely to benefit consumers than to harm them. However, it's undeniably true that vertical contracts can result in anti-competitive outcomes sometimes. That raises a fairly interesting regulatory design question for the FCC. If an outright ban on vertical restraints in the broadband industry can't be justified in economic terms, but there's some chance that vertical restraints can harm competition and broadband consumers, what should the FCC do? The problem with the FCC's proposed per se ban is that there's no way to identify the vertical contracts that are going to harm competition ex ante. It just bans them all. If economic theory and empirical evidence are correct, most contracts of this type will benefit consumers, and others will generate a risk of competitive harm. If only there were a body of law designed to use sophisticated economic tools developed over more than a century and sharpened by economic analysis to identify the vertical restraints that are likely to harm competition and to condemn them and to apply heavy remedies, but also to allow consumers to benefit from those arrangements spurred on by competition, if only there were that type of law. The antitrust lawyers in the room sense the sarcasm. I hope the rest of you kind of do too. But it's a novel policy dilemma for the FCC in this regard. It's a problem antitrust indeed has been grappling with for over a century, and for which it offers a clear solution. Indeed, the same sort of reasoning that promotes the use of tort or contract law to govern occasional disputes between private entities engaged in everyday life and business arrangements, rather than to regulate those activities prospectively, supports the use of ex post antitrust law to govern arrangements between broadband providers and content providers that end up harming consumer welfare. Indeed, antitrust law originally, initially adopted and ultimately rejected a per se ban on nearly all forms of vertical restraints. The FCC need not catch up its understanding of industrial organization economics to the state of play in 2015 to get this right. It needs to get to 1977, when the Supreme Court first accepted the basic economic principles that rejected per se prohibitions of the sort embraced in the open internet order and merger conditions implementing similar requirements. Although the affirmative case for antitrust over net neutrality, at least to me, as an antitrust economist and lawyer, is pretty clear on consumer welfare grounds, net neutrality proponents and others often assert that antitrust might not work in all cases or might not work well enough. That is, the rule of reason might allow some vertical contracts to do in fact harm consumers. <coughs> or that there's some category of harm that is outside of the scope of antitrust but within inside the scope of public interest analysis. I have no quarrel with that proposition as a general matter. The argument seems to be 
that there's this category of harm uh, that's not cognizable within antitrust law or consumer protection law. So not price, not output, not quality, not innovation. None of the things, uh, all of those things are cognizable and well within the scope of the antitrust law. But we should be pretty careful. Now we talk about a form of harm to consumers that's both ubiquitous and predictable in terms of its consistent destructive power, enough to justify a per se ban, but simultaneously only observable to the folks inside the walls of a regulatory agency. In particular, we should be careful about when we invoke that odorless, tasteless, and otherwise unobservable type of harm in the face of evidence of consumer welfare gains. I'm not arguing that doing so is inconsistent with the law. I'm not sure if anything is inconsistent with the public interest standard. But we should be clear as a methodological proposition about how we are going to trade off consumer welfare gains against public interest losses and what it means when we do so. Let me end with what I hope will be a provocative thought experiment about dual and overlapping jurisdiction with respect to the antitrust laws. Uh, could apply to the open internet order, could apply to merger review. I'm an academic now, so hypotheticals are more or less what I do all day uh, with my law students, uh, for better or worse. So here it goes. Imagine a testifying economic expert in an antitrust case in front of a federal judge, defending the following two propositions as an economic matter. One, vertical restraints are so likely to harm competition, your honor, that without case-specific evidence of anti-competitive effects from this vertical restraint, judge, you ought to presume this contract is likely to harm competition. Two, vertical mergers are so likely to harm competition that in similar fashion, a court should presume them harmful and begin the case by imposing the burden of proof on the parties, not the plaintiff. Now, I suspect, having more economist friends than most of you uh, who testify, that that economic expert would quickly be dauberted. Can I use that as a verb for our purposes? They would quickly be dauberted and thrown out of the court on his or her ear. They might lose their economist friends. They might not be able to play, they, the other economist friends might laugh and call them names, they may not be able to play in reindeer games, lots of bad things would happen. Perhaps, <coughs> now some of you I, I know are saying, but uh, the open internet order is the law, it's not economics. The public interest and standard is the law, it's not economics. Yes, I, I, I get it. The law requires the merging parties to bear the burden of proof, uh, and we are just sort of carrying out that burden. I, I, I get that too. But the thought experiment is meant to illustrate the dramatic, dramatic gap between, say, FCC merger review, or the economic foundations of, of the open internet order, and the treatment of vertical restraints on the one hand, and what modern industrial organization economics has to say on the other. It's meant to highlight the tension, and the real role of economics underlying the tension between the antitrust standard and the public interest standard as applied at the, F at the FCC. From an antitrust lawyer's perspective, uh, an antitrust academic for sure, a similar tension caused 1960s antitrust to implode. As economic le learning drove away, as, excuse me, as the economics profession learned more about vertical restraints, about mergers, about industrial organization, economics, the gap between existing doctrine and antitrust law in the 60s and economic knowledge got too big. The doctrine exploded and it imploded in favor of deeper integration of economics and law. Developments in the antitrust, in antitrust doctrine that folks of all ideological stripe and economic views have viewed as largely positive for consumers. That revolution, interesting enough, was led by the courts, not the agencies. The, the agencies reluctantly were dragged along. I do wonder, and I suspect I could learn a lot from the folks in the room and uh, throughout the day, to what extent courts versus agencies will play similar roles in the development and evolution of telecommunications law. It's my hunch that that sort of institutional tension, the tension between uh, economics and existing doctrine, simply can't exist in equilibrium for too long. I'll end there. Thank you for your time, and I am happy to take any questions.
fire away. I've got a question to kick things off. Um, actually, yeah, when it comes to the vertical contracts, uh, is there what is the literature like when one of the act, one of the parties in a contract is a is a monopoly? Does that make it any more likely that the the uh, contract is going to have a vertical? Uh, problem or, or be harmful. So let's separate out theory and empirics first. So in the theoretical literature, you need some sort of market power to make anything anti-competitive happen. Um, and so it'd be, it's not surprising that all things equal, market power means it's more likely as a matter of theory that you generate harm. The trick is uh, the same is true for many of the competitive ex pro-competitive explanations. Right, so uh, internalizing double margins, you've got market power at both upstream and the downstream level makes it, you in turn, that's a pro-consumer effect, right? So Cournot figured this out in the 19th century, um, that internalizing complements leads to lower prices, not higher prices. Uh, so market power cuts both ways, but it is also true that it's a necessary condition for harm. In terms of the empirics, um, some of these studies uh, are in areas where it's not very plausible, you've got market power, and so, so, some are. Um, in terms of the empirics, it's simply hard to find uh, evidence of competitive harm on a systematic level from the use of the contracts in a manner that would sort of be um, acceptable in the economics profession to demonstrate a, a sort of a, a, a general economic phenomenon. So it's hard to answer the empirical question because there's simply not that much evidence uh, demonstrating harm, whether market power or not. But I suspect if you were going to find it, right, market power would be a necessary condition. It just makes the analysis tricky because all the pro-competitive arguments are a bit more salient when there's market power, too. Um, so, you know, you, you talk about the tension between the FCC, uh, you know, public interest test and, um, you know, the evolution of economics and, and, and sort of the evolution of the thinking. And, um, you know, certainly the public interest test gets to something that seems to be a much more old school antitrust uh, a, a, a viewpoint. And so I, I guess the thing that I, I always come back to is, um, you know, why is it so clear? What, what is so clear that economists today are, you know, smarter than the economists and the lawyers, uh, you know, of old, like uh, a, a Brandeis, for instance, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, getting this law right? You know, what is, what is it about today's economists that, that makes them so much smarter than those people? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to object to the premise of the question, and then I'm, I'm going to change it and answer something else. Uh, <laughs> but I'm going to explain what I'm doing while I do it, so there's nothing in my sleeves. Uh, so it's not that the economists were smarter. The economists weren't allowed to play in the 60s. The law was not ask economists. The law was not what's the effect on price. The law was if this is a tie-in arrangement, is it a conditioned sale of razors and blades? If yes, you have violated the Clayton Act. It's, it's also section one, it's, it's, it's criminal, you may be indicted. It, it was a formal structure, it wasn't asked the economists. The economists were hanging out in universities writing stuff, and they were saying, hey, look at all these stupid antitrust cases, let's write about them. And eventually somebody listened and it started to influence the law. Um, so it's not that the economists were better or, or worse or anything else. Uh, George Stigler was around in the 60s and 70s. He was, it was pretty darn good. Uh, but at the time, they were working on really low-hanging fruit. Right? Much of the, con the conventional wisdom was, uh, in economics was, and this says more about the state of economics in the 60s, um, for reasons I won't bore you with, uh, the conventional wisdom was the best way to predict the prices in industry was to count the number of firms on your fingers and generate price predictions. If my seven-year-old can do it, it's probably not sophisticated economics. Um, now, there's some casual intuition to it that works in some cases, right? We hold a lot of things constant, and we abstract away from a lot of market dynamics, but that was really the state of play. It, we, we didn't have very good data. What we did, the, the, sort of the best economic studies, the ones from which the sort of relationship between the number of firms and prices were generated were, uh, cross-sectional papers where you just sort of said, you're in the widget industry, let's count the number of firms and look at the prices. You're in the ball bearing industry, let's count the number of firms and look at the prices. And you over there are in soda, let's do the same thing, and then we'll just draw a line. Well, it turns out, if you went with those sorts of studies uh, to a leading economics journal now and said, here's my cross-sectional paper 
on the relationship between the number of firms and prices, you, you probably get dabbled in federal court, but you definitely don't get your paper into the journal. That's not so much a shot at the economists of the time as the technology economists have used have changed over time. People started caring more about things like causation. Econometric techniques got better. Part of that is they got better because we got better data. Scanner data changed the world. The economists were able to spend a lot of time working on techniques uh, that they wouldn't otherwise have, computing power, right? Um, so it's not an indictment of the, the economists. One, uh, but the antitrust lawyers and judges didn't listen to them in the 60s. That didn't happen until the late 70s. Um, and they were interested in different questions. So the, the science evolved. Um, you know, it took an empirical turn. We now know a lot more uh, empirically than we did in the 60s or 70s. The sort of first battle was laying out the theory and then it was getting data. Um, like other uh, social sciences, or hard sciences or whatever you like, you know, we sort of ebb and flow between data and empirics and, uh, and knowledge develops that way. The interesting thing about antitrust has been some attempt to integrate the learning from the field, um, not just uh, when convenient, but required by law. If you're not doing, you know, sort of an economic approach to antitrust law, be, you, you may be committing malpractice. I mean, this is, uh, the Supreme Court has said, thou, thou shalt do economics. Um, and that's a unique feature, and um, it's certainly not as deeply embedded in other areas of law, uh, but it has been a, 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 a real success story uh, in antitrust, and one that the agencies were slow to catch up on with, uh, but I think are now, usually with respect to the FTC and DOJ, um, lead more than they lag when it comes to integrating economics. The, the example I like to give this, this most is in 1977, the FTC and the DOJ in their merger guidelines said, um, no court is accepting an efficiencies defense for mergers. This is not in our interest to suggest to courts that they do so. We win the cases when there's no efficiencies defense, but we will put it in our guidelines and we will tell courts you should think about whether there are efficiencies from the mergers that outweigh the price effects, and if so, we should lose. Uh, this is, those are agencies exhibiting leadership to get the economics right, sometimes at their own expense. Now, I'm an economist. I might want them to do it more than they do. Right? I have you know, my own idiosyncratic preferences on that margin, but I think uh, their historical performance is quite good and quite rare. I, just, I, mean, I mean, I think if you hold that up to the open internet order and sort of read the economic, mean, I think they're worlds apart. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, is there a question down in front? Or? Yeah, here, we'll run around. I'm sorry, one second. You, you talk about when the, there's a divergence between the economics and the law, and that <clears throat> and eventually the law caught up with the economics. What happens where there's not the same kind of procedure, like an FCC review, where you can put, at least in mergers, you can put the companies out to administrative pasture for two years in an administrative hearing, and there's no mechanism? What would cause the divergence to, the, to converge? Yeah, so that's, that's a fascinating question. And, um, you know, it is certainly the case, you know, in my view, the ultimate integration sort of revolution in antitrust law is a complicated phenomenon when a whole body of doctrine tax uh, all, all of a sudden and quite quickly by quasi common law standards. Um, there are a lot of causes. It's sort of oversimplifying to say in antitrust the courts did it. There were a lot of things that happened. Economic oriented judges got appointed. You know, the Posners and Williams and Easterbrooks and Ginsburgs of the world who at an appellate level had a substantial influence on the law um, uh, were, were appointed and had a lot to do with the, sort of in the, in the 80s. The Supreme Court went before that uh, in, in, in 77. It was largely led by the courts uh, and to the extent that a mechanism, you know, in the FTC, when parties come before me on a merger and staff would like to sue and the parties come in and they bring their experts uh, and we sort of, you know, explore the evidence and talk to the staff and make a decision in the back of, you know, we are, we are, we are having that discussion. If we're talking about remedies, we are, we, are, we are bargaining in the shadow of the threat of litigation in front of an Article III judge in which uh, the success rate of the agencies in court in, in recent years is pretty darn good. They're, they're, they're litigating cases quite well um, and they've got a, a, a great staff to do it. 
But that is always in the background. And that threat, I think, is a, has been a critical part of that, that evolution. Now, there, there are some institutional features in the telecom space that aren't as present um, in the antitrust space. So we don't do much in the way of rulemaking on the competition side. Consumer protection, we will label your fur products and so forth, right? But on the competition side, we don't do much in the way of rulemaking. And so we, we, we don't get much in the way of regulatory review in the DC circuit um, for competition-related things. I think it's going to, if it happens, it is going to have to happen either through um, rules rather than merger review. Okay. Um, and on top of that, I mean, at some point, uh, to the extent that the, the divergence is too great between sort of overlapping merger review uh, bodies, you know, events like that tend to sort of catalyze change. I, I will say, and, and, I, and I should have, I meant, meant to sort of allude to this, but let me sort of be a little bit more, more blunt about it. I think the, the, the actual quality of the work that is done inside the FTC and DOJ on merger review is um, amazingly good. It is amazingly good. And at the FCC, uh, there's been a real attempt, and I don't mean to belittle it at all, to do work similar to what happens when the FTC and DOJ are reviewing mergers. The questions are not one, I can't say it enough, um, it's not one about capabilities, right? The agencies are designed to have economists have different levels of influence, right? And, and those decisions, those design decisions are, uh, you know, I think it would be folly to call them you know, historical accident or something like that. Agencies can control uh, the way they do these things. So it's not, you know, this is not a statement about the quality of what's done. It's about the mechanism for economic analysis to influence decision making. There are problems with the FTC and DOJ structure in this regard too. Um, but I think in terms of organizational structure, not just within the agency, but also the threat of litigation, um, the structure there is, is much better designed to get integration of economics. Whether you like the public interest standard and think that there are, I mean, there are serious arguments that there are things outside the consumer welfare standard that ought to start, that ought, that ought to count. But to which an economist says, okay, well, I can give you the consumer welfare piece, piece of the puzzle. Here are the consumer welfare benefits. And I can price it for you. Tell me the public interest benefits are greater than that. Well, here you go. Right? But we can at least have a more serious discussion about what the trade-offs are. And I think um, to the extent the economists and economic thinking more generally, not just the economists, um, are sort of empowered by the structure of, of the institution. So I just, I just had a question um, kind of on the phenomenon you're talking about, intra-FTC. Um, intra uh, where the Bureau of Economics may come to one conclusion and the Bureau of Competition sort of comes to a different one. Curious kind of how that's treated and then as a sort of follow-up to that, is it treated differently, do you think, under a Republican chairperson or a Republican-dominated commission versus a Democratic one? The second question, no. Um, I, I, I don't think so. Um, I've been in the agency and, and sort of both of those, those setups. And, and I mean, here's the thing, I mean, most of the staff, the staff are there and have been there through all sorts of administrations. The economic staff don't, um, their careers don't change if the FTC wins or loses a case. You're in the BC staff and you win a case in litigation, you exit to a firm and you have a, you know, you eat better things for dinner than you used to, okay? Uh, that's just not the, not the case on the economic side um, as, a, as a general matter. Now, um, you know, everybody's got their incentives. And I think on the economic side, it's the rate at which the Bureau of Economics generates recommendations that split from the Bureau of Competition is pretty constant over time. I mean, you get some natural fluctuation. I don't think it's political. I think it has much more to do with um, industry-type trends. You've got economists who work on, if you get more farmer mergers, there are five guys who do the farmer mergers, and they have some views. And you tend to get, if they 
you know, vary with the, the, the lawyers you use, you tend to get more disputes. I think it has much to do, much more to do with sort of natural cycles than anything else. Now what happens uh, when you get those sorts of disputes, they're common. I think um, the FTC, I, I am sort of fond of describing, it is a place that um, institutionally is built for conflict, all the conflict. Um, commissioner on commissioner, um, be economist against lawyer, with respect to economist and lawyers, management versus staff, right? You have commission versus management, all kinds of conflict, um, of which the econ versus law is sort of one type that ebbs and flows over time. And indeed, the agency made a decision um, in the 80s that what it would do is uh, embrace that kind of conflict. It said, instead of having our economics division be subservient to the lawyers, reviewing and investigating the case, we're gonna appoint a Bureau of Economics director who reports to the chair and that's it, um, who gets an independent recommendation. And they work together on investigations, there's some discussion, I think people like when they agree on the cases um, more than they don't, there's some effort to do that. Uh, but the idea of having an independent recommendation invites that sort of conflict. Having Folks from different parties with different experiences and different views uh, invites that sort of conflict also. And I think when done right, that's conflict that makes the place better at decision making, uh, not worse. I'm, I'm not a big fan of the idea, at least at the FTC, that decisions with no votes um, are bad for the world. I'm biased, I'm the guy with the no vote, okay? Um, but that tends to be the way, I see, the, the way I see it. It's sort of built for that sort of conflict. And on hard questions, the ones that these types of agencies grapple with, you, you're gonna have hard questions and you're gonna have some reasonable disagreement. Um, so I think mostly it's handled by, you send the, they send the recommendations up and people say their piece and commissioners decide, but it's not shunned or anything like that. Great, I think that might be all the time for questions we have. We're gonna take a short five minute break and get the uh, first panel up there, but thank you very much to Josh. Great. It was thank a you. fantastic speech.